disapprove of the practice of having consorts for doing a kind of sexual, spiritual practice. This is a, something that developed later in the history of Indian Buddhism. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I want to continue. Okay, now there's going to be something of a change of theme in the sutta. Or at least, let's say, a change of emphasis, since what follows here is still picking up on the behavior of the monk Arita, but it shows a kind of the underlying agenda, let's say the underlying agenda that Arita had. And this is what is called the wrong grasp of the Dhamma. That one learns the Dhamma not for the purpose of fulfilling the proper aim of the Dhamma, not for obtaining the true benefits of the Dhamma, but one learns the Dhamma in order to engage others in debates and defeat them in debates. This could be a particular weakness in the Indian mind, because the Indian spirituality can become very intellectualized, and so it has become a tradition, even at the time of the Buddha, for the ascetics belonging to the different spirits, schools of spiritual teachings, they would meet regularly in these parks and in open monasteries, rest houses, and each one would come with his own teaching, and then they would engage the others in debates for the purpose of defeating them in debates. But now the, this must have also been taking place within the community of the Buddhists themselves, that the Buddha found that people were learning the teachings and then sometimes becoming very learned in the teaching, knowing many different texts, different positions, and then not putting the teaching into practice, but instead using these teachings to come up sometimes with what seemed like eccentric or odd hypotheses or theses of their own, and then trying to draw on discourses of the Buddha, you know, selective quotations, taking statements out of context, then using them to argue in favor of their position. Like in the Dhammapada, for example, there is a verse, it's a rather peculiar verse, that says, even though one slays mother and father, two Brahmins and a Kshatriya king, one still goes blameless. <laughs> and so somebody can pick that verse out of context and say, look, the Buddha is encouraging matricide, parricide, the killing of religious, of priests, the killing of kings, so why don't I do the same? Okay, but that would be a misreading because there must have been an explanation of the symbolic meaning of that verse. And so to understand the verse properly, one has to know what's being symbolized. But if one just quotes it out of context, one could use it to justify the most bizarre, the most horrible crimes. Okay, so here the Buddha takes the case. He speaks about some misguided men who learn the Dhamma. And then the compilers probably added this, putting in the nine divisions of the Buddha's teachings in the very early period. The discourses, stanzas, that are those are texts that are composed with mixture of prose and verse, expositions, verses, exclamations, sayings, 
birth stories, marvels, and answers to questions. But having learned the Dhamma, they do not examine the meaning of the teachings with wisdom. Since they don't examine the meaning of the teaching with wisdom, they do not gain what is called a reflective acceptance of the teachings. That is, by reflecting and examining the teaching, when one understands the meaning, then one accepts the meaning, because on the basis of one's investigation. Instead, they learn the Dhamma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates. And they do not experience the good, or it could be the goal, the benefit, for the sake of which they learned the Dhamma. Then those teachings, which have been wrongly grasped by them, lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. Why is that? Because of their wrong grasp of the teachings. And now we come to the simile that gives its the, the title to the discourse. Here we have a man needing a snake, seeing a snake, wandering in search of a snake, and he sees a large snake and he grasps, grasps it by its coils, by the center of the body, or by the tail. When he does this, then this is what's going to happen. The snake will turn back on him and bite his hand, or his arm, or his leg. And if it's a poisonous snake, then the poison goes into the body and the man might die or suffer terrible pain. And why is that? Because of his wrong grasp of the snake. Okay, so this is the wrong approach to the Dhamma. And now the Buddha takes the contrary case, the right approach to the Dhamma. Here, some clansmen learn the Dhamma, and having learned the Dhamma, they examine the meaning of those teachings with wisdom. Then having examined the meaning with wisdom, they gain a reflective acceptance of them. They do not learn the Dhamma for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates, and they experience the good the benefit, the goal, for the sake of which they learned the Dhamma. Those teachings, being rightly grasped by them, lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. And why is that? Because of the right grasp of those teachings. And then comes the positive version of the simile. We have the man who needs the snake, he sees the large snake, and then he doesn't just grasp, grasp it at the middle of the body with his hand, but he uses a cleft stick, it's a stick with two little branches like this, so he could put the branches over the neck so the snake can't turn its body around. And then having done so, he grasps it rightly by the neck. Again, I mean, I wouldn't want to do this myself. <laughs> I don't trust my ability to grab a snake. So I used to, in my early years in Sri Lanka, there was one monk, elderly Sri, Sri Lankan monk. He was the chief monk of a place called the Island Hermitage. And he was very famous for catching snakes that would get onto the island and you know, put them in a bag. And he knew all of this, the skills necessary in catching snakes. And so he became almost a legendary figure for his ability to catch any kind of snake. <laughs> so you use the cleft, snake, uh, cleft stick 
to press the head down, grab it correctly by the neck. And then even though the snake might wrap its coils around the hand or the arm, but the snake is not able to turn the head around and bite. And so in this way, the man can catch the snake, take it away, and do what he wants with it. And why is that? Because of the right grasp of the snake. And so this is like those clansmen who learn the Dhamma, examine the meaning, gain the reflective acceptance of it, and then practice to realize the goal of the Dhamma. Okay, then the Buddha gives some advice. He says, therefore, when you understand the meaning of my statements, remember it accordingly, and when you don't understand the meaning, then you should either ask me about it, or ask the wise monks, like Ananda, Sariputta, Mahabhogalana, Mahakasapa, ask them about the meaning. Okay, the next portion of the simile, uh, the next portion of the sutta presents us with a very famous simile which is used to illustrate what you might call the practical or pragmatic aspect of the Buddha's teaching. Again, this has the purpose of showing how one should use the teaching, how the, the teaching is proclaimed for the purpose of practice and realization and not just for the purpose of storing in one's head. And so this is the simile of the raft. So the Buddha says, I, sh I shall show you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. And here there is a kind of wordplay involved in the idea of crossing over. Since in India, in northern India especially, there would be many large rivers and branches of these large rivers, particularly during the rainy season, when the rain comes pouring down and then the Ganges River swells up, the Indus River swells, the Brahmaputra River swells, all of these rivers go flowing. And so if one is traveling, one has to, at many points, one has to cross over the river to go from the side where one is starting out from to reach the other side of the river. And so if it's a small river, like a creek or a stream, there might be bridges. But if there isn't a bridge, then one has to take a ferry boat or construct a raft to get across. But this idea of going across, of crossing over, then becomes used as a metaphor for gaining liberation or gaining enlightenment. So this shore becomes known uh, seen as a metaphor for samsara, the world of birth and death, the world of ignorance and craving, the world of suffering. And the other shore is a symbol for the realm of enlightenment, nirvana, nibbana, the mukti, the state of liberation. And the process of cultivating the path in order to move from samsara to nibbana, this is compared to crossing the river. And so the word crossing over comes to be used for the process of cultivating the path. And the person who is said to be crossed over, that is used to indicate the enlightened person, the liberated person.
And so the Buddha develops the simile. He says, suppose there's a man undertaking a journey. He sees a great expanse of water. The side that he's on is dangerous. The other shore is safe and free from danger. But there's no ferry boat and no bridge to cross over. And so he thinks to himself, let me collect grass, twigs, branches, and leaves. I'll tie them together and make a raft. And then riding on this raft and making an effort with my hands and feet, I will get crossly, safely across to the other shore. And so the man makes the raft. He crosses over the river. And then he might think, this raft has been very helpful to me since I used it to get across the river. Suppose I were to put it on my head or load it onto my shoulders and then I can go about wherever I want. So now the Buddha says, is this man doing what should be done with the raft? Is he using the raft wisely? And then the monks say, no, venerable sir. Then the Buddha says, what would that man do if he is wise? What would he do with the raft once he gets to the far shore? Then the monks reply, when that man got across, then he might think, this raft has been very helpful to me. Suppose I were to haul it up onto dry land or let it float away in the water and then I can go wherever I want. In that case, the man would be doing what should be done with the raft. And so the Buddha says, I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft. It is to be used for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Now similes sometimes, can sometimes be a little misleading. And I think that can be the case with this simile too. Because in this simile, it's the man who goes across the river and gets on the other shore, who puts the raft on his head or shoulder and then carries it around wherever he goes. But if we apply the simile, the person who reaches the other shore is the Buddha or the Arha. Those are the ones who are enlightened, who have used the Dhamma for its proper purpose. And they will certainly understand what the Dhamma is to be used for. And so just there's no chance at all that they'll just carry the Dhamma around in their head without using it for its purpose, since they've already used it for its proper purpose. But th those who keep <laughs> put the Dhamma on their head or on their shoulders and just carry it around, will be the people who are still very much on this shore. And it's generally those types, the same type as the person who grabs the snake in the wrong way and gets bitten. This would be the person who is using the Dhamma, learning the Dhamma, sometimes just to show off, to show how learned and wise he is or who uses the Dhamma to provoke arguments and disputes, or sometimes what I found in living. <laughs> For many years in Sri Lanka, people base their sense of personal identity on following the Dhamma, being a Buddhist. Like, I'm a Buddhist. Buddhism is the best religion. <laughs> it's better than the other religions. And so, you know, they might have be bumper stickers, be proud you're a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> then you ask them, um, what kind of practice are you doing? <laughs> they say, practice? <laughs> we, have, we have to wait till the time of Maitreya Buddha to start the practice, right? <laughs> yeah. For now, we just do the <laughs> devotion. Or I compare it 
It's like the man who goes to, he gets ill, and he goes to see his doctor, and the doctor writes the prescription for him, and the man takes the prescription home, you know, he has a nice altar, <laughs> he puts the prescription on the altar, and then three times in the morning, he bows down to the prescription. <laughs> Three times in the evening, <laughs> he bows down to the prescription. He offers incense and flowers and fruits to the prescription. <laughs> but he doesn't think, use the prescription to go to the pharmacy and get some medicine? Is that what one is supposed to use the prescription for? <laughs> Okay, then comes the very important and well-known statement, paragraph 14. When you know the Dhamma, I'll use the word that's used in the original Pali text, when you know the Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even Dhamma. You should abandon even Dharmas. How much more then should you abandon uddhammas, non-dhammas? Now there's a certain ambiguity here in the word dhamma in the plural. The ambiguity comes from the fact that <clears throat> the word Dhamma has several meanings in the text. Sometimes it's used to mean mental qualities, particularly virtuous mental qualities or wholesome mental qualities. And sometimes it's used to mean teachings. And sometimes it's used to mean phenomena, existing entities in general. And so there's some ambiguity in the original, how exactly should we understand the statement? And the pro this is a problem in being a translator, one has to make choices. The only way to escape making choices is to use the original, but then it becomes puzzling to the uh, to the reader, especially a word like Dhamma is in the plural. And so the way the commentary explains it, the commentary takes it in the sense of qualities. And it says that you should abat, the commentary says what is meant by the qualities here are samatha and vipassana, that is tranquility and insight. And so you use tranquility and insight to cross over, to reach the other shore of liberation. And then once you reach the other shore, of course you go on practicing tranquility and insight, but you don't have to hold to them tightly anymore. Like, you don't have any attachment to them. And as you are using tranquility and insight, cultivating them in order to cross to the other shore. You shouldn't be attached to them, but just use them as pragmatic devices, as parts of the path. Or we could say is, use them as a ladder to climb to the roof. Don't cling to the ladder. But before you throw the ladder away, <laughs> make sure that there's a staircase in the building. Okay, so we can understand the statement in that sense, 
But it seems to me that the sense that's intended should, because that meaning doesn't really connect very well with the earlier part of this discourse. But if we take the word teach, Dhamma to mean teachings, then the statement will agree very well with the simile of the raft and with the simile of catching the snake. You take the teachings like you're catching the snake, you examine the meaning with wisdom, and then you gain the reflective acceptance of them, and then you practice in order to reach the goal of the teachings. And once you reach the goal, then in a sense the teachings become unnecessary for oneself, except as a means for helping one to teach and to guide others. But once one realizes the goal, then one is beyond the teachings. So, the Buddha's sense here is that you use the teachings like a raft to get across, but once you're across, you can give up the teachings, and even when you're crossing, don't just cling blindly and with a kind of dogmatic tenacity to the teachings. And certainly you should give up things that are contrary to the teachings. And this statement also comes to be used, or sort of referred to, in the famous Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Chedika Sutta, where, you see, in the time of the Vajra Chedika, or Diamond Sutra, it was probably composed at a time, a period, when the Abhidharma was beginning to flourish. It was one of the main activities in the monasteries was to accumulate these lists of dhammas, which are held to be things that have ultimate or real existence. And this became a kind of obsessive concern of monks to get the right list of the dhammas, the kind of catalog of all phenomena. And so the Diamond Sutra and the Prajnaparamitas literature is saying that all dhammas are empty of self-nature. And so Diamond Sutra interprets this with the implication don't cling to the notion of there being truly existent, self-existent phenomena, but just see all phenomena as being empty of any kind of self-nature. here and then ask whether there is any questions. Okay. Oh. When, uh, when you say it refers to the second meaning of the Buddha's teachings, but does the Buddha's teaching in Pali singular or plural? Yeah, okay, this is an interesting point. Um, usually it's set forth as a singular <laughs> Dhamma, but here the plural is used, it's Dhamma, which occasionally one could have it used in the plural. In fact, sometimes in a single paragraph there will be the transition from the plural to the singular. It's rare. Excuse me? It's rare. Um, I wouldn't say that it's rare. One finds both both senses used, or both forms used. Any further questions? Yeah, Richard. The um, the use the use of the word gamma, the the capital D. Yeah. Is that clearly representing the, the teaching without interpretation? And the dhammas with the dhamma with the plural, that's the one that's different interpretation? Yeah, first in, in Asia, the Asian scripts that are used to record the Buddhist texts, 
like single script, Burmese script, Thai script. There's no distinction of capital and small letters. So that's the choice that an English translator uses. But where we have the singular, I think this is my convention, the singular where it definitely and clearly refers to the Buddha's teaching, then I use the capital D. Especially when we have something like the Dhamma is similar to the raft, there is a singular. Or if we have the expression, they learn that these misguided men learn the Dhamma, and then it enumerates different types of the teachings of the Buddha, then it clearly is referring to the Buddha's teaching. Regarding debates, when interfaith groups get together for discussions, should a Buddhist maintain that there is no such thing as a creator god? <laughs> okay, I think when interfaith groups get together, of course, Buddhists have to explain the Buddhist, say, the Buddhist understanding, Buddhist positions, but for there to be friendly and cordial relationships. I would say that the Buddhist doesn't maintain this or present it as a dogmatic position intended to vanquish the followers of other religions or to humiliate them or to... Conf he doesn't present this position in a confrontational stance, but just says, according to Buddhism, we don't teach that there is a creator God, but we say that this manifest universe is without any discoverable beginning, but still things are regulated by a kind of imminent law of cause and effect, and that there is a moral law which governs our ethical actions in that way. So I think one should try to be, you know, to hold discussions in a friendly spirit aimed at mutual understanding, not in a kind of confrontational, antagonistic way. Okay, some other internet questions. This goes back to the tantric sexual practices. Even by monks is taught in some Tibetan esoteric Buddhist sects. Sects. <laughs> S-E-C-T-S. Should Buddhists consider tantra as a red flag? That it is not really Buddhism, but Hinduism, shamanism? Of course, there, is, there are forms of tantric Buddhism. We can't say that tantra is Hinduism, not Buddhism. There are differences between Tantric Buddhism, Tantric Hinduism and Tantric Buddhism. Um, I don't consider myself in a position to put past judgments on the practice of, of Tantra. I don't know enough about it. Um, I think it's a form of practice that can, let's say, that can be easily abused. And the way I understand within the circles, it almost what I've been told in 99.9% .9 of Tantric Buddha circles, actual sexual practices are not undertaken. Now there's something popular called, and this is true about Tantric Hinduism too, there's something popular going around amongst many Western spiritual teachers, they call it Tantra, and you can see it all over the internet, probably if you just put in Google Tantra, you get many of the Western groups, and there'll always be the smiling couple, man and the woman smiling, we will teach you Tantra, come to our retreat at such and such a place, for you know, $1,000 for two nights. <laughs> and how to experience the most ecstatic sex that you've ever had, and to hold orgasm for 25 hours unbroken, <laughs> we will teach you that. But I've asked some you know, practitioners of both Buddhist Tantra and Hindu Tantra whether this is really Tantra, and they just shake their head and say, it's so sad. I remember a few years ago, 
the year 2000. I had gone to Hamburg in Germany to give a lecture. <laughs> and there was a kind of spiritual magazine that came out, you know, that gives a report on what's going on in town, on the spiritual scene. On one side of the page, a lecture by Theravada Buddhist monk Bhikkhu Bodhi. <laughs> Maybe if they should have put underneath Buddhist meditations on death <laughs> and the 32 parts of the body. <laughs> and the other side of the, the other page, facing page, the smiling couple, <laughs> Gottlieb and Gertrude, <laughs> lecture on Tantra, <laughs> same evening, same time, in different places. <laughs> What should I go to? What will be more exciting? <laughs> okay. Is there a sutta where the Buddha scolds a widow, widower, I think, for having sex with someone's wife, but said that if he cannot control his urges, he should visit a prostitute? I don't recall the sutta like that. Does anybody know? <laughs> what is the Buddhist view of legalized prostitution, such as Las Vegas? Let me look up Las Vegas in the end. <laughs> um, I guess it would be under proper names. Let's see, Kusinara, Lichabis. Yeah, I don't find Las Vegas there. <laughs> um, let's say that, <laughs> I mean, Buddhism isn't encouraging people to go to prostitutes or encouraging prostitutes, women to, to lead lives as prostitutes. But I don't know that there's an official Buddhist view on legalized prostitution. And I think in most, well, actually in Thailand, it's sort of passively tolerated. In Sri Lanka, the Buddhists don't like it, but it goes on. I don't know, one could just work out one's own views. I won't present my own personal view about it. Okay, I think we'll stop now, and we could come back, we could go up for lunch. But for those people who want to come back for the discussion, because still it's not yet, I think it's not yet officially open to the public. And then we could just have a little more discussion after lunch, back here. About 12, 15 or so. Okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. I'll recite the verses for sharing the merits. And then the next class will be not next week, not the week after, but the, uh, from a long way till October 17th. Did I say October? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Why do I associate April and October? <laughs> Strange. Okay. Okay. April 17th. <laughs> April 17th. And we will continue and try to finish the this sutta on that, that day. Okay, so if we share the merits, I'll recite them how. Pakasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyam ta manumodipa shiram rakantu sasana. Pakasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyam ta manumodipa Shri Ram Rakantu Devisana Akas <coughs> Chabuma Ta Deva Naga Mahitika Panyanta Manumodipa Shri Ram Rakantu Mamparam Eta Vatacham Hei Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Deva Namodam Tu Sabe Bhutanu Modantu Sabe Satanu Modantu 
sabasam patesatya pavagupadhaya pavirchi hetato etantare satakai upapanna rupya rupicha sangya samino dukha pavuchantu pusantu nibutin Right.